Um, and I'd like to uh, begin by uh, inviting Kate Rosenshine uh, 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 to come and talk to us. Uh, Kate is Cloud Solution Architect Manager um, at Microsoft um, and really will kick us off uh, with uh, a view of how companies who are at the forefront of these technologies really view the, the whole issue of digital ethics. So Kate, over to you. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction and good morning everyone. Um, my name is Kate Rosenshine and I lead a team of data architects as Microsoft and we are a part of our customer success unit here in the UK. My team works with key customers across financial services to help them on their journey to cloud, and more specifically on all things data, from the fundamentals of data platform through to AI. We see that AI is already shaping the world and becoming a part of our lives. We use search engines, dig digital personal assistants, and recommendation systems daily. And AI is also being incorporated into our core social institutions. Today, I want to talk about what, how AI should be shaping our world as, and some of the key ethical considerations that we as a society need to take into account to ensure that we're shaping an ethical AI. Now, we talk a lot about technology, but there are many other challenges that will go beyond the technical. And my background is in science, so I'm a molecular biologist by training, where I worked on genetic engineering research. And what's really fascinating to see is that more and more organizations are embracing innovation that used to reside in research institutions, but at the same time also thinking about the great responsibility that comes with it. And we as a, as a society are currently on a journey with AI, much like we have been in the past with other transform, transformative technologies, including bioengineering. It's working? Great is working. So I want to start by level setting. What do we actually mean by AI? Now AI has a long history and that definition has changed every few years. But fundamentally AI is about computers understanding the world, reasoning from large sets of imperfect data, as well as interacting with humans in natural ways. So first understanding AI enables us to understand and interpret data of our environment and our world at scale. For instance, identifying meanings of text, speech, and images. With reasoning, machines do this by taking large amounts of imperfect data and adding logic on top of that so we can understand and make decisions based on that data. And it continues to learn over time as we keep feeding it more data. And finally, interacting. By extending human ingenuity, and lowering the barriers between human and machines, the goal is to allow machines to communicate with humans in a much more natural way. And what AI currently is, is not just a technical definition, but also a set of business and social definitions and thought processes where we take large quantities of information and use it to, take, to train decision-making algorithms to produce results that we then go and use in different ways. Now, the reason we design machines is to amplify our ingenuity. And technology needs to be designed in a way that helps us level up on a capacity that we don't have. Therefore, allowing us to scale through machines with the things that they do better. For instance, pattern matching and complex calculations. So now a bit of history. AI has been around for a while, and the term AI was first coined in the 1956 Dartmouth Conference on AI, where a group of scholars got together for a fun summer project and said, let's create intelligent machines. So they met over the summer to discuss what AI is and define it and start working on it. And in the dark Dartmouth document that they produced, they stated that if they worked really hard on this AI problem for a summer, they really believed that they could achieve AI very, very quickly. Um, and here we are today still trying. Now, since then, there have been waves of interest in AI and AI winters where AI simply seemed not to work. So the field has had some great advances, but also dead ends. So AI research and understanding has been here for many decades, and we as humans has, have been pursuing this for a while. Now, the interest in and the possibilities of AI 
are accelerating today because of three forces that have happened just in the last decade. So first is lots of data, which is continuously increasing every day, and AI needs data in order to work well. The second is huge amounts of computational power, especially with cloud technology. And the fourth is better and more powerful algorithms, which allowed ideas that have really been around for quite some time to improve in accuracy to the point where they become of great practical value. And with these technological advances, AI has become more and more accessible. And AI is already here and seemingly everywhere. And there is no denying that we are in a new era of AI which will transform many aspects of our personal and professional lives. And AI really is the emerging, emerging power behind daily life. So AI has many applications for improving people's lives, from better lives for refugees by helping them maximize job prospects to better hair by helping maximize good hair days. And as the field, of AI is evolving very rapidly. We need to think about the implications to our society, not just a few years ahead, but even further beyond. And the next decade will also present challenges that will go beyond the technical. And we start, as we start to harness the potential of AI, this will affect our legal, social, and economic fabrics. Now, when we talk about harnessing this great potential of AI, we need to think about doing so successfully, but also responsibly. We need to be cognizant of the wider implications of these systems and the vast benefits that come with them. A study we at Microsoft recently conducted found three core considerations for this. First is to really embrace AI's potential. And this is about how the organizations can start using AI today to grow. The second is to be a should organization. So how organizations can take an ethical approach that ensures that AI has a positive impact, not only economically, but also socially. The, four, the third is to develop tomorrow's skills today. And this is about organizations thinking about how they equip employees to understand and use AI to augment their roles, but also to think about the younger generation and how we prepare them for the future. And these will not only be technical skills, so AI has a potential to achieve great things, to augment abilities of humans, to create breakthrough advances in areas that we have already seen with healthcare, transportation, agriculture, and education. And we also need to explore some of the more complex and broad societal concerns which these advances will bring with them. And building public trust in AI will be key for society to gain benefits and growth from this technology. New systems and control measures will have to be put in place to ensure that society prospers and to prevent malicious misuse of these technologies. Now, building public trust in AI will, um, sorry, building public trust in AI um, will be key for society to gain benefits and growth. And to do so, AI systems should not be created in vacuum by any one company, government, or nation to develop unchecked. It should be shaped by and open to everyone. The public will also need to be educated so that we make sure we ask the right questions. And we are at an important part of history where AI, in AI, where a lot of critical AI systems are entering the real world and starting to interact with people. So we're at the inflection point here where, where whatever AI does and the way we build AI has consequences for the society we live in. And when we think about harnessing this potential and the responsibility that comes with it, we have to create ethical principles and values that AI needs to respect. At Microsoft, we focus on these six core principles that we need to follow. As a technology becomes more and more a part of the pro products and services that people use every day, we need to focus on building trust through responsible and ethical AI. And AI ethics must also align with human eth ethics, and this evolves over time. And some of the key questions we should be asking is, how do we ensure AI is designed and used responsibly? How do we establish ethical principles to protect people? How do we govern its use? And how this will impact employment and jobs? And as we look into a future powered 
partnership between machines and humans, it's important that we address these challenges head on. Um, with reliability, safety, and privacy and security, um, these areas have been a part of the industry and Microsoft as well for quite some time and we have made great advances. But now we need to focus on the application of these into AI systems as well. And I want to focus on the other four core principles that are at the center of much of the public debate that we see today. So some of the key challenges many organizations are not now starting to define are not about the technology alone. We must also think of the ecosystem of challenges from other disciplines, including psychology, economics, and law that sit around these algorithms to fully address issues to do with fairness, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability. And this is something that many organizations are already thinking about. Just this week, Kathy Bassant, Bank of America tech chief, defined responsible AI projects in the bank, stating that technologists cannot lose sight of how algorithms impact real people. So what does this mean in practice? Um, with fairness, for example, thinking about how we can prevent inadvertent discrimination due to reliance on historical data. Um, for example, with mortgages and loans. And bias in data is a very real problem that can create ha harms of allocation when goods or services are denied from a certain population. With inclusiveness, AI systems have the potential to create a digital divide or to narrow that divide that already exists. AI could allow organizations to attract more diverse talent and also create products or serve markets. With transparency, uh, regulation is a key driver for organizations to really embrace this, but also as the landscape becomes more competitive, organizations will be looking to create more meaningful relationships with their customers, and transparency in decision making is key. Um, but even when there is transparency in the process, there's still a risk as we need to ensure that these systems are used in the right context as well. And for these decisions, there needs to be accountability as they have a wider reaching impact. And this will require multidisciplinary skills and oversight within organizations. So I wanna take a few minutes to unpack some of these concepts. Um, like I said, technical solutions are not the only solutions and we need to think about how we represent our society. And this is something that a technical solution cannot alone fix. AI focuses on developments that aim in theory to mirror human intelligence, reasoning, problem solving, and persuasion. So AI, like many other sciences, will need to draw on other fields of research and academic disciplines, for example, learning, psychology, social science, and not only computer science. And multidisciplines should contribute to AI development. Some of them might be less obvious. And this is why progress in AI may be dependent on progress in these disciplines as well. And now uh, taking us back in time once again to talk about how these other disciplines could come into play, starting with classification and its roots in biology. And this is something us humans have been doing for a while. So here we have Greek philosopher Aristotle in the blue robe speaking to his mentor Plato. Um, and he organized 500 types of animals by their features. And this concept of natural classification was revolutionary at the time. Now, since then, classification has always been a product of its time and also reflects the social order. And so attempts to classify always reflect the social, cultural, and political frameworks of that time. And data is classified, and as we see, we have a long history of doing this, and AI has really supercharged this ability. AI systems are dependent on data to learn, and classification is at the heart of what AI is today. And therefore, we need to understand the social practices, especially that of classifying people. Yes. So bias is a deeper and constant feature of classification. It is an artifact of classification. And algorithms learn about the world by ingesting large amounts of data, and data is created by our society, so our models are very data hungry, and the quality of performance that we see from the models at the end of the day depends on how well data is collected. Now, data collection is not a real science, and we have our insights, we have our assumptions, and we do data collection that way. Hmm. Um, 
And so the data is not always a perfect representation of, our, of the world. And there has been a persistence that the more data we have, the more representative it is. But that's simply not the case. If you're oversampling from a particular population, your results will be skewed. And when our data is not the right representation of the world and it's not representing everything we care about, then our models cannot learn some of the important things. And that means the data we have is not neutral. And here we can see examples of this with facial recogn recognition in which algorithms recognize white males at, with a much higher accuracy than females of color. And we see this also when we image search the word doctor, for example. Um, apparently, there are not many female doctors, even though here in the UK, about 45% of doctors are female. So we need to think about where this data came from, how it was collected, and what was its original intention for use. And when we design AI systems, we need to make sure they are designed to be fair and to avoid bias as much as we possibly can. And we need to also understand how bias could be introduced and how we might be able to detect it within our systems. And this requires us to think of human review as well as diversity in our teams. And this brings us to diversity in AI. Um, and this is even more important today as we, get, we have more and more far-reaching global implications of these technologies. And this is because we're designing computers to think like human beings. And we cannot do this in a way that reflects the diversity of thinking in the world unless we have diverse teams working on this technology. Now, when we talk about machines thinking, it's not in the way that we as humans think about thinking. It's going beyond procedural decision making to training an algorithm to design better algorithms for the broader system. So they won't really be thinking, they will just no longer be being doing what, exactly what they're being told to do. Um, they will be re reiterating on themselves. So therefore, we need to think about how we're prioritizing the problems that we choose to work on as well, as this touches on diversity. And today, a homogenous dominant group is influencing the tools that are being developed, and they don't necessarily fully understand the economical, social, and political context of the ways that these will be implemented. So there could be risks that come with this lack of diversity. And this really creates a cultural change for a lot of organizations as they start to think differently about their technologies in the workforce. And there is a bigger and bigger need for people from a whole range of disciplines and backgrounds to contribute to this technology. And these are things we need to think about to ensure that we're not amplifying inequality in the workplace, at home, and in our legal and judicial systems. Discrimination could potentially inadvertently be built into machine learning algorithms that underlie technology behind many intelligent systems and how we're being categorized. And this could be very subtle. So with that, I want to talk a bit about the need for humans in the loop to ensure that these principles are implemented and debated. Because as we have seen, AI is not neutral. Uh, so this is another, another story, and this is Eliza over here, who was one of the world's first chatbots and one of the first programs to attempt the Turing test. Um, this was created in 1966 by Joseph Weizenbaum, and in the most famous doctor script, Eliza simulated a psychotherapist. So Eliza was using computational linguistics and simulated conversation by using pattern matching and substitu substitution methodology that gave users an illusion of understanding by giving non-directional questions to user inputs. But Eliza did not contextualize a conversation and was not really capable of truly understanding. Now, Weizenbaum was really surprised and disturbed by the number of people that attributed human-like feelings and intelligence and understanding to Eliza, despite his insistence that this was not the case. So people were starting to develop deeply delusional thinking and believing that what the automated system is telling us is real. And the term automation bias was coined. And this describes a phenomenon where people will accept a decision from a system much more than a human because they assume it's neutral, ignoring contradictory information made without automation, even if it's correct. 
So even the earliest pioneers of AI were concerned about this myth of neutrality and bias. And so if machines are expected to be fair, and as we know, that's not the case, we need to make sure that we have human oversight. In his influential book in 1976, um, Weizenbaum makes the crucial distinction between deciding and choosing. So deciding is a computational activity, something that can ultimately be programmed. Choice, however, is a product of judgment and not calculation. And it is this capacity to choose that ultimately makes us human. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with this story, but this is uh, Gary Kasparov in 1997. Um, and he was the reigning world of chess, the world champion of chess. And he lost to a computer, IBM's Deep Blue. And initially, he accused Deep Blue of cheating. But then he became more interested in how computers could work together with humans to augment the capability of human chess players. And he coined the term Centaur Chess to describe the variant of this game in which human, a human participant is paired with a computer. Um, and this helps in the, in the decision making, including suggesting moves. So in Greek mythology, a centaur is a race of creatures that is half, half man, half horse. Um, so the lower, body, lower part of the body is a horse, which uh, gives it speed and stamina. The upper part of the body gives it dis dic the dexterity and intelligence of a human. Now, in this version, centaur is a mixture of human and machine, with the creativity of human and the computing power of a machine. And combined, they can outperform just humans or just machines, as we can see in the graph over here on the left. So machines are really good at automating repetitive tasks, for which we have a lot of data for. They're really good at recognizing patterns and doing things at scale. But humans are really good at common sense, creativity, counterfactual reasoning, and learning from a few examples. So we need to think about these complementary strengths between human intelligence and machine intelligence, and what kind of value can be generated from using both of them to make our daily lives better. And we need to think about building, building systems that use the power of AI to complement what humans are good at and support them for the things they want to spend time on. And machines and humans also approach problems in different way and make different kinds of mistakes. So when we combine them together, we get something stronger than they could do separately. And this complementary is a future for AI, and we're already seeing examples of this today. So with that, these are some of the key ethical considerations um, to enable continued innovation at scale. AI experts need to work hand in hand with regulators. It is very important to have a dialogue between different people, communities, who have a stake in the game, to get them talking with each other. Because if we cannot explain where we are as a field to the public, we risk something happening which causes us to turn our backs on, our te on this technology, and we would forgo all the amazing benefits that could come with it. And technology workers today are really in a unique position that has influence. And there is responsibility that comes with these systems. And there should be a lot of accountability. And just because we can doesn't mean we should. So one of the things we need to ask is, could we see a Hippocratic Oath for coders uh, like we see for doctors today to make sure our citizens are safe? And so how do we prepare our society for AI? And what do we need to do to prepare today's workforce and future generations for these opportunities and for the skills to comprehend these technologies. As AI capabilities continue to evolve and expand, the organization's best place to succeed will be the ones that recognize that humans plus machines tend to out outstrip humans or machines. <laughs> like we have seen, this is a focus on augmentation and not just automation. We need to focus on developing tomorrow's skills today. And there will be a shift in the nature of jobs, and therefore, the skills required. Technical literacy will be key to navigate um, the digital landscape, adapt, and collaborate with AI. But as we have seen, it will not be technical skills alone. And while many of today's roles will probably look very different in just a few years' time, 
I do believe that this will not change the fact that humans are paramount too. So we need to think about the future generation. And now I wanted to share a story from one of our recent hackathons um, that we conducted with an amazing group of teens, which gives me a lot of hope for the future. And I will let you hear it from them in this short video. Chatty Sam is a self-esteem boosting chatbot for young teens that promotes social interactions. Sam is perfect for children of this age because Sam will never judge you and is fully understanding of everything you say and do. Sam is really demotivating when you go to STEM events and you look around and there's like two girls in the room maybe you're probably going to be the only one. I felt it's really inspiring to see there's so many girls um, who want to do AI and find technology so inspiring. I'm just so happy to see all these wonderful girls who want to do STEM and um, I'm just really, I uh, feel really motivated to go into the industry and make sure more girls go into STEM as well. By giving them that extra support, you can make them, you know, become much more successful. And you'll probably be thankful if you're like, you know, in like 10, 20 years when they have their own company and they're extremely happy and they have loads of money and they're doing what they love, that you just took the time to tell them that you believe in them and that they should never be discouraged from doing um, what they love. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much for um, what I think is a, a really excellent scene setting uh, in terms of how uh, a really large company like Microsoft uh, kind of views um, uh, the approach to, to the development and deployment of these technologies. And, and the key message for me there was, was that, um, that nobody can do this in a vacuum. You know, and that, you, that there's a real need to make sure uh, that even the largest companies with the resources that they've got are engaging broadly um, uh, across multidisciplines and, 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 and all aspects of society to, um, uh, to, to really kind of drive this agenda forward. So, Kate, thank, thank you very much. Now, we are a little bit short of time, and I know that our next speaker has got a fairly busy day ahead of her. So, Kate, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and, and we are going to, to move... Uh, Move, move, move to the next session.